welcome back friends welcome to another video tutorial from Shomu's biology we have been talking about uh, the cellular respiration and the stages of cellular respiration in the last video we saw the different stages of cellular respiration starts from glycolysis then pyruvate dehydrogenase complex Krebs cycle and at the end the electron transport chain that helps to finally generate energy by utilizing all the macromolecules after the digestion which are carbohydrates, lipids and proteins. Now in this video we are going to talk about the first part of the cellular respiration process that is glycolysis. And whenever we are talking about glycolysis and all the stages, I also mentioned that we are mostly talking about the carbohydrate metabolism. So among these three molecules, here we are focusing on carbohydrate metabolism and how carbohydrate uh, is used to produce more and more energy uh, as a result of cellular respiration. Now here we know the cellular respiration process are of two different type aerobic respiration and anaerobic respiration. Now in aerobic respiration it requires the presence of oxygen when it helps to produce more and more ATP. While there is less amount of oxygen present in that case that's known as an anaerobic respiration. So cells start shifting from aerobic mode to anaerobic mode if they don't have enough oxygen to carry the electron transport chain. In that case, the number of ATP generated will be far, far less. So we'll see the difference between aerobic respiration and anaerobic respiration in some other video. But now let's concern about the glycolysis. Now glycolysis is the very first step of the cellular respiration and this is kind of a kind of a heart of every metabolic processes because this is the starter process where a carbohydrate molecule is taken and produce the first intermediate and first major intermediate that is pyruvate. So the job of converting any carbohydrate molecules into pyruvate is very important because this is the first step, major step of the cellular respiration. Because this pyruvate molecule has several different fate. It can help in not only producing energy throughout the Krebs cycle and electron transport chain, but also pyruvate can go back and produce glucose if required. So if our body needs glucose, in that case pyruvate can revert back and produce glucose via a separate pathway. If it's required, pyruvate can also help in the, the production of other macromolecules in our body, which is known as anabolic pathways. Anabolic pathways are those pathways where we construct macromolecules while catabolic pathways are those pathways when we break down macromolecules to generate energy. So here we are talking about catabolic pathway. So pyruvate is a product of a catabolic pathway which is glycolysis but it can be used to generate other molecules through anabolic pathway. So that's why it's a very important step. Now here the first part of the video I'm just going to give you an overview of glycolysis and what we are doing in glycolysis. While in the second part of this lecture, we will see animation and animated tutorial that is going to explain you each and every step of glycolysis pathway. The idea in glycolysis that we start with carbohydrate, let's say we start with glucose. We can start with any other sugar, we can start with fructose, uh, we can start with uh, galactose, uh, sucrose, any other sugar we can start with. If we start with a disaccharide, we need to break them down into monosaccharides and then we can begin. So if we have polysaccharides, we need to break them down again into small fragments or monosaccharides, then we begin the glycolysis. But once we begin the glycolysis, the job is to convert the monosaccharide into pyruvate using 10 separate stages. Now you may find different numbers in different book, but the idea here is simply making the end product which is pyruvate and very, very important molecule. Now the job here is the glycolysis process is divided into mainly two different parts. First part is preparatory phase and the second part is payoff phase. So let me divide it. We can break them down into preparatory phase and payoff phase. The idea about the preparatory phase is that at this preparatory phase of glycolysis, the first few steps and those steps required energy. We need energy for the process to start with. Actually, it requires two molecules of ATP at this preparatory phase of glycolysis. The second phase is payoff phase. And in this phase, 
they develop and the glycolysis tapes generates ATP molecules. So that's why it's known as payoff. And actually they produce four molecules of ATP at the end. So if you calculate the ATP cal gain at the end of the glycolysis, you will see two molecules of ATP as a net gain at the end of glycolysis pathway. That is the idea. So in this case, you will see different enzymes involved in the pathway. But remember few things while we are talking about the different stages. That in glycolysis, you will see several stages as unidirectional. Okay. And those are the regulatory stages. And you will see most of the stages are both multidirectional, both the direction, bidirectional stages. In those cases, the enzyme required for converting a front product into the back and back to the front will be same. While that unidirectional stages, which is one of the stage, if I give an example, the first stage of glycolysis, conversion of glucose into glucose 6 phosphate, this is a step unidirectional. So you cannot go back pretty easily for this type of stages. And these are generally regulatory stages of glycolysis. That is the idea. Now the question is where the glycolysis process works. If we talk about the cell of prokaryotes and eukaryotes, glycolysis works inside the cytosol everywhere. Okay. So the whole process works in cytosol. All the enzymes required are present in cytosol and they convert glucose into pyruvate. That's the job that we need to do in glycolysis. So let's look at the animation to check what are the different stages and enzymes involved. Okay friends, now we will see an animated tutorial to talk about the different steps of pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. We will see the involvement of three separate enzyme complexes. First one is known as E1 or pyruvate decarboxylase. The second one is known as E2 or dihydrolipoamide transacetylase. And the third one is E3 or also known as dihydrolipoamide dehydrogenase. As the name suggests of each of the enzymes, they have associated functions to play. Now, if we look at the three different part of or three different subunit of this PDC complex, E1, E2 and E3, you know, and we, if we look at the overall reaction scheme, that is we have pyruvate and we have coenzyme. So, this COSH and pyruvate together form acetyl-CoA and the carbon dioxide is released from the pyruvate structure. That is our idea at this point of time. And it will also reduce NAD into NADH plus H plus. So if you look at here in this picture where you see E1, E2 and E3, three different subunits of this pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. The first subunit that is E1 is linked with the process of transferring and modifying pyruvate and releasing carbon dioxide from the pyruvate. That is why it's known as a decarboxylase enzyme. This enzyme does the job of release of carbon dioxide. While E2, if you look at here, E2 is involved with the process of uh, production of acetyl-CoA while transferring the coenzyme A into the acetyl uh, the group that is a uh, carbon group that is present. So the products of pyruvate dehydrogenase complex has already been produced right after the effect of E1 and E2. So what is the importance of E3 at the end? The answer to that is E3 is, is a subunit that is required to re-establish everything so that the process can continue in the next round. Because E3 helps in the process of recycling NAD by converting NAD into NADH and in that case NADH produced from this step can be used to generate energy via the process of electron transport chain coupled with the ATP synthesis during the process of electron transport in mitochondria. So let's look at here the overall process and how it begins. In order to generate acetyl-CoA, the PDC first convert pyruvate into an immobilized activated acetaldehyde group using one of its subunit enzyme that is E1 or known as pyruvate decarboxylase. In this case, if you look E1, E1 is a bound, it has a bound coenzyme thymine pyrophosphate or TPP, which readily forms a strongly nucleophilic carbon ion. This is the carbon ion that formed by TPP. The carbon ion formed on the coenzyme 
TPP then performs a nucleophilic attack on the 2 carboxyl carbon of the pyruvate and as it's going to this nucleophilic attack and release one carbon dioxide molecule and that pyruvate other carbons will be linked to the TPP carbon there. After the carbon dioxide is released, the immobilized molecule and the TPP rearrange their bonds to form a bound active acetaldehyde. We call them hydroxyethyl TPP. After the carbon dioxide is released, we have this active acetaldehyde structure at the end, which is kind of uh, a little more stable than the previous TPP structures. Now next, the 2 carbon molecule is transferred to coenzyme A, forming an important citric acid cycle metabolite, acetyl-CoA, via a lipoic acid coenzyme bound to the dihydrolipomide transacetylase enzyme or E2 enzyme. So here we see this is the E2 enzyme and this is the bound form of the E2 enzyme and here this step most likely another carbon ion is formed. And it is created by a basic amino acid present on the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, more importantly between the E1 and E2. The carbon ions electron from, form a bond with a lipoic acid arm on E2. As you see, that's how it starts to transfer the, the part of carbon, uh, the, the, the carbon skeleton from the pyruvate uh, to E2. Now the acetyl group is passed to a second lipoic acid arm from the first arm because it's not very close to E3. That is a simple transfer. After that, at this point this acetyl CoA is produced when the acetyl group is transferred to coenzyme A, an entirely uh, other process. And in this case, once acetyl CoA is produced, it takes entry into the TCA cycle. Now the final step that is the production of NADH, which can be used to generate ATP. In this case, what happens, we see at the end, once the acetyl CoA is produced, we don't have any substrates to work with anymore. But the job will be to reconstruct the whole complex of enzyme. If for doing that, what we see here is the sulfhydryl group are reduced in the lipoic acid arm. And in this case, this reduced sulfhydryl groups are used. And in this case, uh, they start to reduce FAD which is connected to E3. So it starts reducing FAD into FADH2 or you can also form like FADs also reduce NAD into NADH and we know NADH can directly take entry into the electron transport chain and we can produce energy out of it. So this is how the whole process continues. Now one important fact about this if you look at electron microscope in electron microscopic image here in the left hand side the, electro, the E. coli pyruvate dehydrogenase complex is 4.6 million Dalton in size and comprised of 60 polypeptide sequences. That's going to give you a glimpse of idea that how complex eukaryotic pyruvate dehydrogenase complex is going to be. I hope you understand this video. Thank you. So if you like this video, please hit the like button, subscribe to my channel to make it grow and also make more and more videos like this for you and also share this video with every friend and also in every social networking sites. Thank you.